Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is really, um, I mean, we've accumulated so much knowledge in our heads, right? It's pointless actually if it just stays there, right? It's all about applying it. And the best way to really learn something is to teach it, right? That is Joey Chan, Principal Consultant for Cloud Jedi Solutions. I'm Josh Burke, your host for the Salesforce Developer Podcast. And here on the podcast, you'll hear stories and insights from developers for developers. Today, we sit down and talk with Joey on a wide range of topics, especially his organization of the Philippines Developer Group and Philippines Dreaming. But we start with how he was learning Salesforce. A lot of it is really about going through the documentation. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that I did in order to basically keep up with all the rest of the uh, ecosystem is I try to find all of the possible Salesforce related blogs that I can find. Mm. And if you remember Google Reader, um, mm. I yes. used to subscribe to all of it and basically go through all of the past posts that I can yeah. find. And basically my thinking there is, hey, I want to learn as much as I can about Salesforce. And this is my way of uh, making sure that I know as much as I can about it. That way, once we have a potential client, I'd know mm-hmm. as much as about it already, right? So. Nice, nice. No, I miss the days of Google Reader, and I sometimes joke that that a podcast is one of the few bastions of an RSS feed that's still out there. Right, right. <laughs> in speaking of leveling up and training, you have 15 certifications, is that correct? So far, I haven't been <laughs> counting, but around that much, <laughs> yes. Some of it okay. probably just expelled already, but yeah, mm-hmm. still Got it. right now... I'm not directly collecting certification anymore, okay. but of course, uh, I'm still learning, right? Um, right. Right now, we're focusing a lot more on the business side of things, so mostly uh, a growing marketing, uh, sales, and also. Got it. In that loop of getting certifications, do you have any advice for people who are looking to get certified? Um, my best advice is basically start scheduling it as soon as you can, mm. and then do the work. Got so it. I usually uh, schedule mine, let's say, one month ahead. And okay. then basically just block off the time of your calendar. Hey, for example, um, Saturday or Sunday, I'll make sure that I spend four or five hours just going through the material, right? And mm-hmm. uh, personally, though, uh, I know there are quite a lot of free and paid resources out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I usually just stick with the official resources, though. Mostly really hmm. just trailhead and documentation. Okay. That's actually okay. more than enough. Got it. Definitely, there are a lot of study materials that's paid that can help. But for me, uh, I've never had to do that. So you haven't ne- necessarily had to like rely on example questions like or, or, or study tools like that? Correct, yes. The thing is, right. I mean, most of the free ones are even probably worse because some of the answers <laughs> might not be correct, right? So Right. It'd give you like a kind of a misleading view of what the exam might look like. Correct, yes. And uh, most of the time, it's really just a study guide and uh, looking mm-hmm. at the documentation themselves, right? Got it. Got it. Now, I want to just hit back on that really quickly. Do you book the certification exam early so that that gives you like a forcing function that you're like, I have to study for this because it's on my calendar? Exactly. Yes. So basically, it. uh, it's something to force me that, hey, this is target. And we uh-huh. have to make sure that we at least take that exam on that day. Got it. Got it. And how did or how has things like answering questions online and, and working with things like Stack Exchange, how has that influenced like how you've been training the Salesforce and also how you've been interacting with the community? One of the things that uh, I probably lacked back then when I was starting is basically opportunities to learn a lot about Salesforce. Mm-hmm. The thing is, uh, you only get the projects depending on what it is, right? But you don't necessarily get exposed to uh, all of the different possible use cases that people around the world are experiencing. Right. My way to compensate for those is to actually go through the answers community and try to as- help as much people as I can Got Basically, it. whenever I encounter a question that I don't know the answer to, I would then mm-hmm. search for it and then answer it for them. So mm-hmm. in the process, I'm learning uh, the different aspects of Salesforce that you don't normally get to touch. Got it. So so you're using sites like Stack Exchange as a, as a reason to go out and research and learn new code. Correct, yes. Well, uh, back then, uh, Stack Exchange wasn't really a thing yet. So it's oh, right. a lot of it is the answers community. Got it. Got it. Got it. Nice. Yeah, no, I, I love that in part because that, that mirrors 
actually, to, to be honest, it's one of the reasons we have Trailhead is because I would go to my workshops and I would talk about intermediate to advanced topics like Apex REST. And what I found consistently was it wasn't that the developers didn't necessarily know of the existence of Apex REST or similar things, but their job had never given them an excuse to go out and actually try it. And it's like, that's what we wanted to do in the workshops with like some of the early prototypes of Trailhead was like, here's a challenge to kind of force you to go and fix like an Apex REST kind of thing. So, right. yeah, it, I mean, yeah, that's one of the things that I really like about uh, the Trailhead. Basically, as you're collecting more badges, you actually... Mm -hmm. uh, are technically uh, learning a lot along the way. Uh, a lot of those are things that you don't necessarily uh, get to touch in your day-to-day -day work, right? And same right. thing with certification, though. Um, I view it not necessarily as uh, something that proves your expertise, but mm -hmm. it basically tells everyone that, hey, you have this baseline knowledge about this part of Salesforce, right? Right, and right. Yeah, basically just learning things that you normally wouldn't touch. Like, right. I mean, things like advanced currency management, things like those. It really depends on the company that you're working with, right? If they right. need that or not. So. <laughs> Right. In our, in our platform, there's a lot of dark corners that people don't necessarily have to go shed a light into. Right. Right. When did you start to kind of move from you focusing on, you know, learning and researching and answering questions to getting involved with and even organizing community groups and events? Well, here in the Philippines, it wasn't around 2018 or 2019 where we actually get more uh, people involved in Salesforce. Mm -hmm. I, I tried to start something back in 2015, but then there weren't really that much community yet, at least people involved in Salesforce yet during that time. Gotcha. So a lot of my involvement was literally on the online communities. Mm-hmm. It's only um, back in 2018 to 2019 that uh, we actually started having in-person meetings. Mm -hmm. But then, yeah, building up the community. And, and what was the motivation for that? Why did you want to get a local in-person event running? A lot of it is really sharing the passion with Salesforce. Because throughout my whole career, technically working career, it's all focused on Salesforce, right? I've spent countless hours on Salesforce. And whenever I hear someone talking about Salesforce, it makes me feel excited, though. Because imagine oh, you're um, giving so much time to something, and um, whenever it's being talked about, hey, I can know I can share something about it, and you'd learn something about it, right? So it's really about that. And mm -hmm. really paying it forward, I mean, Salesforce has given me, given me quite a lot in terms of uh, career opportunities. And uh -huh. the thing is, I'm not sure about other technologies, but Salesforce gave me the opportunity to work with companies all around the world hmm. while staying within the Philippines. Gotcha. Nice. That's interesting in that it sounds like one of the big benefits of doing something like that is you're kind of like you're creating like a feedback loop, like you're sharing information, you're getting information, and you're also getting like... I guess a community feel good movie because you're, you know, you're, you're doing it live with other people who are also being passionate about this kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it's really sharing what you know, right? I mean, mm -hmm. whenever we look at, let's say for people that we uh, look up to a lot mm -hmm. of times, it's actually because they shared something or they're sharing information that you're learning from, right? You then trust this person and then you look up to them. Right. So yeah. yeah. Nice. And it sounds like we kind of alluded to this in that one of the challenges of getting a local developer group up and running is just that critical mass of, of getting enough people together in order to, to you know, really have an in-person events. What are, what are other, some of the challenges that you've had in, in forming and keeping a community like that going? A lot of it is really about engagement. The thing is, especially right now with COVID, uh, I guess right. part of the challenge is bringing great content uh, and being great speakers, right? A lot of what's being discussed is probably already re being recorded somewhere. So either it's through the Dreamforce website or some of them are actually in YouTube, right? And there's mm -hmm. quite a lot of videos about different topics. I mean, it's all in YouTube right now, right? Mm -hmm. um, I guess before COVID, a lot of the benefit of having the in-person event is actually 
not just the the session itself, but actually yeah. the discussions that happen around it. Oh, and absolutely. After that, yeah. And yeah. the friendships that are made and people really out there to help each other. I mean, mm-hmm. typically whenever people ask around, usually it's an opportunity for for you to actually give them a more much more in-depth answer on what they need, right? And yeah. it's really just sharing what you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to say, it's one of the things I always loved about doing developer group presentations was was not the presentation itself, but the Q&A that would, would come after, which I think has always been some of the most engaging moments of Q&A that I've, I've had when I've been on stage. But also, more importantly, the little tidbits that I learn from developers, which may have nothing to do you know, with like the presentation that I just gave. I didn't know continuous integration was a challenge on the platform <laughs> until, mm-hmm. you know, and this was years ago, right? But I, you know, I'm having a conversation with somebody about CI and Jenkins and stuff like that. I'm like, that's interesting. And now I, now I can go back and, uh, you know, and actually research that a little bit. Right. A lot of it, I guess, is because of the focus of our jobs. You usually mm-hmm. just exposed to uh, what we have to be exposed to, right? We mm-hmm. don't normally get to experience how, let's say, a, a Fortune 500 company does things. And they usually have a lot of things there happening all, all around, right? So the, mm-hmm. the challenges are different all across the board. But it's all happening within the Salesforce ecosystem, right? And yeah. that's also one of the uh, my motivation is really uh, back then is to understand how things work for both the small, medium, and large companies. Because most likely for large companies, unless you're working for them or yeah. you're part of a large consultancy, you won't necessarily get a chance to work with them directly, right? So mm-hmm. in tidbits like that, I usually get uh, uh, insights in terms whenever I talk to people. And part of what I usually do uh, whenever we have uh, in-person meetings is actually going around and meeting all the different people within the community, just talking mm. to them, just understanding what they do, uh, what they're focused on, and basically building their relationship. Yeah. And a lot of times, uh, they usually have problems. And I mean, we're all excited to help someone with their questions, right? So right. that's part of it. Nice. Mm -hmm. Well, going back to the elephant in the room, how has the pandemic affected this kind of of organization and organizing? And, um, you know, what what kind of new content are you seeing? What kind of new interactions are you seeing? Mm -hmm. So with regards to the pandemic, um, actually, we were initially planning on quite a number of events. Um, Here in the Philippines, what we did uh, in terms of the community is we actually organized ourselves into one big group. Okay. I know uh, for other countries, different groups have their own setup, right? But right. what we did for the Philippines is uh, we are organized ourselves to make sure that we're not stepping into each other's events, basically. Mm-hmm. So we have the developer group, the admin group, uh, marketing cloud, Pardot, nonprofit, women in tech. So just making sure that we're clear in terms of what we want there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, make sure that we're all organized. Nice. Have you changed your strategy on like how to get speakers now that it's not in person and you have sort of access, so, sort of more access because you can kind of ask anybody to to appear remotely? Right, exactly. So one of the things that um, we thought about during the pandemic is, hey, um, now that we are forced to go virtual in terms of the user group meetings, yeah. One of the things that we try to take advantage of is, hey, there's nothing stopping us from inviting people from around the world to, to speak for our within our group, right? Mm-hmm. So one of the things that we did is we actually started what we call Salesforce MVP series. Mm, this is nice. where we would actually invite all of the uh, people, the groups want to listen to, like mm-hmm. people like Steve Mo, a lot of Salesforce MVPs. I mean, they're doing quite a lot of uh, contribution to the community, right? So they're fairly well known. So right. they are the type of people that people want to listen to, right? So that <laughs> helps a lot in terms of attendance. And mm. of course, uh, we're also recording all of those. So it can mm. be found in our YouTube channel. Gotcha. Nice. And you'll have to remind me to put a link to that YouTube channel sure. <laughs> in the in the show notes for this episode. On the flip side, if I if I'm reading LinkedIn correctly, you spoke at the Cleveland Developer Group. So what's it been like on the on the other side of it that you can now connect remotely with DGs that you probably never would have visited? 
Right, exactly. Well, one of the things that I enjoy really is to be able to connect to um, all of the different groups around the world. Basically, being able to interact with a lot of different leaders, understanding uh, how their community works, and mm-hmm. what we can actually apply on our own communities, right? So with regards to that Cleveland developer group, um, one of the things that I shared there is the five free tools that you can easily install within within Salesforce that can help both admins and developers in their daily oh. work. So a lot of it are mostly um, free Chrome extensions and okay. some are web application. So yeah, it's all recorded to them. Okay. Can you give me the elevator pitch of those five tools? Like sure. the, like, like a quick description. So uh, the first one is uh, Salesforce Inspector. Mm-hmm. One of the things that it allows you to do is uh, easily um, see all of the fields within that specific record. So typical use cases, uh, if somebody needs to look at a field that's not on the page layout, you usually mm-hmm. have to either add it on the, on the page layout or go through the re- a report to see it, right? So with that specific tool, you can see all of the fields, values, and then um, part of the feature is uh, being able to, for example, log in, easily log in as a user, just typing things in. Other tools are like Salesforce Organizer, where within Salesforce Classic or Lightning, you could move to different parts of the page or set up just hmm. by typing it. If you're oh, familiar nice. with Alfred and mm-hmm. Map, mm-hmm. It, or yeah. basically a quick search, uh, within Salesforce, right? Most cool. of the time, we already know where to go, but it takes time <laughs> right. to do the clicks, right? So we can save a few seconds here and there, so it adds up. Nice. Another tool nice. is Salesforce DevTools. It allows you to easily um, generate really nice Excel files that shows you all of the metadata information about a specific object. It includes like um, field name, label. Um, if it's a formula, it even includes a formula itself, pick less values and things like those that nice. most admin can easily use though for cool. data dictionary. Nice. On the organizer, I find that funny because in my workshops, I used to joke that if I didn't tell people that the quick filter existed in setup, that I would mm-hmm. probably get stoned by the end of the day because right. that thing just saves so much time. Yeah, I mean, it's even faster <laughs> if you were using a Salesforce organizer. Sure. Right? So. Nice, very cool. So with all of this kind of changing in trends and how people are interacting and speaking, Do you think in like a post-vaccine world where we're not trying to, you know, stay away from this, this, this virus, do you think that the, the community is going to keep kind of a virtual layer of interaction or go back full in with in-person events? I'm a hundred percent sure that virtual is never going away. Gotcha. Because there will always be uh, something because um, there are quite a lot of benefits with going virtual. But of Mm -hmm. course, there's also a lot of cons with it, right? But uh, there's still going to be a place for virtual meetings, Um, Mm -hmm. especially here in the Philippines. The problem Mm -hmm. is the traffic. Imagine if you just need Mm -hmm. to travel uh, around three to five Mm -hmm. miles. It could take you at least an hour. Gotcha. Interesting. Interesting. So that's usually a challenge. And uh, people usually can't just leave their work whenever they want to. Mm-hmm. So usually there's a specific time. So you need to have a specific um, schedule for that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, back then, we usually have it around 7.30 p.m. Got so it. you usually can't have really that long of a session, right? And uh, right. you only have so much time. So that's part of the challenge. Interesting. Tell me some of the cons of this virtual interaction layer. Like, what are some of the drawbacks that you're seeing? Well, uh, one of the things that's missing right now is a lot of the interactions between the participants are uh, either eliminated or minimized a lot, right? One of the things that I've been noticing is people tend to simply just listen and then drop off after it's done, right? So um, I think, Uh, One of the most important things that I'd want to build up is how we can help each of the participants know each other, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they know the organizer, but uh, in between them, I mean, it helps a lot if um, they can have discussions here and there, right? So the way, one of the ways that we're actually uh, addressing that is we also have Facebook groups because here in the Philippines, Facebook is really big. Gotcha. 
that's almost anyone that you know probably have a Facebook account unless Got they it. intentionally didn't want to have one. <laughs> Got it. So um, that helps in terms okay. of uh, quick discussions here and there. But at the same time, it would be nice to have uh, really discussions uh, in between. Mm-hmm. We typically have between 50 to 70 people within our user group meetings. So mm. it will be quite hard to have everyone talking right so right right you can't just wander off to a corner and have a one-on-one right yeah Yeah. are you seeing anything with like like zoom fatigue so far for us i think depending on the person that may be a consideration yes Mm -hmm. Uh, because the problem with the pandemic i mean everybody's working from home right right Um, Part of the challenge there is um, people tend to have back-to-back meetings now. Mm -hmm. Before, you usually have some break in between, but you're basically, hey, whenever somebody sees a a blank available time on your calendar, they would book it up (laughs) and then... (laughs) (laughs) I'm not sure if that happens to everyone, but that's some of the styles that I see. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. So usually during the evenings... um, People mm-hmm. just tend to want to rest, right? So. Right. <laughs> right. That makes sense. Okay, let's talk about it in a slightly broader scope. When did you start organizing uh, Philippine Dreaming? Uh, and what was the motivation behind that? We did uh, Philippine Dreamings um, on October. In terms of mm-hmm. organizing it, we didn't actually uh, have that much time. I, I believe we um, started immediately after, um, I believe... Tri- if I remember correctly, it's Trailhead X Global Gathering. Okay. So that's probably just around three to four months lead mm-hmm. time. Yeah. So one of the things that we did there is, I know we can actually make it bigger. Um, we had around 240 participants back then. Um, nice. I, we know that we could actually make it bigger, but none of us actually had uh, professional experience in terms of organizing such an event. So we'd Got rather it. just set our ex- <laughs> expectation and make a great <laughs> event rather than trying to go too big, right? We yeah, were nice. actually initially planning on having what, at least 500 participants this year, okay. but the pandemic happened. So right. And technically, we're still not a- allowed to gather here in the Philippines. So, mm, and gotcha. most companies are basically on a work from home arrangement. Mm-hmm. So even if we wanted to, uh, we aren't allowed to. Mm-hmm. So. Do you have any advice for somebody who's thinking about doing something like this, but like yourself has no experience in it? With regards to the Philippine ha- streaming? Is that, is yeah, that? yeah, I should say had no experience in it because obviously you've been in the, in the waters now. Um, I guess it helps a lot to have the comment of a set of people. I mean, mm. you can't really do it alone. You gotcha. need a team to do things, right? I mean, much like any event, like, for example, a wedding, there's mm-hmm. usually a team of people that's helping each other out, right? right. It's really finding that core team that you can work together on and really go through the up, up and down, right? I mean, nice. it's definitely not something smooth sailing, but it's definitely a great experience and it definitely helps help a lot in terms of building the relationship with each other. Got it. Got it. So moving more into your business side of things, you have the distinction of being number one on the app exchange developer listing, and you're not just highly rated. You're actually have been rated a lot as well. Uh, was this like a professional goal or did it just sort of happen? Well, uh, it's not really a goal in itself to me, mm-hmm. but of course, um, Part of it is, of course, the rating system of, of Salesforce, right? Mm-hmm. So um, whenever we work on a project, uh, I usually um, request for some review there, right? So that way, um, it's not just lost in the void. I mm-hmm. usually have it either in LinkedIn or yeah, there in the app exchange. So I guess part of it's really being there uh, mm-hmm. s- since early on, back in what, 2010. So a lot of really accumulated number of reviews of the different companies that we've worked with. And at least for our setup, we usually work with a lot of SMEs. So uh, the typical project could last between weeks to one or two months. So the the cycles are actually fairly quick. So we tend to get a chance to work with a lot of different companies. 
I know for larger companies, you tend to be stuck in, let's say, one project for like a year or two, right? So mm-hmm. I guess that's part of the difference there. Uh, when did you, did, were, have you always worked as a team or did you kind of come to a conclusion that you can get work done either more efficiently or go after bigger projects if, if you formed Cloud Jedi, you formed a company? Well, I technically started Cloud Jedi in 2010. Okay. So um, most of the years, actually, for the past, what, seven, eight years, I've mostly been doing things on my own. Mm-hmm. But nowadays, I, I'm mostly building a team, mainly because of capacity building. I okay. mean, uh, we've grown our client base to the point that, hey, I can't do this alone. No? So, right. I mean, as much as I'd like to, I mean, uh, <laughs> I'd have to sacrifice quite a lot of things, especially now that we have two kids. No? Uh-huh. So we have... Uh, Three year old and a six months old. So got it. Yes, I've I've heard that they can be um, at least a little bit time consuming. True. Right, just a little bit. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, it's just one of those things that I try not to uh, well, try to make sure that I don't ignore them. <laughs> A good goal to have indeed. Now that's our show. But before we go, I did ask after Joey's favorite non technical hobby, and it turns out he gets a lot more exercise than I do. For me, it's actually CrossFit. So. It also helps me in terms of making sure nice. that I'm not working too much. Mm, so, mm-hmm. Although it's still a workout, so <laughs> <laughs> at least it gives me a lot of sanity in terms of uh, not facing the computer too much. I want to thank Joy for the great information and great conversation. Of course, I want to thank you for listening. Now, if you want to learn more about this podcast, head on over to developer.salesforce.com slash podcast, where you can hear old episodes, see the show notes, and have links to your favorite podcast service. I'll talk to you next week. 